Good muggy afternoon to everybody. Um, I thought I left this in Massachusetts, but I guess I did not. But it's good to be here with everyone. And thanks to my fellow readers uh, for doing what they've done. And it's so good to be here and hear everybody's delicious weirdness and the way our brains work and the sort of ways in which our, we create music out of the ineffable. Um, I'm going to be reading from my computer because I've noticed that the older I get, the smaller they tend to make the print. And so, um, Kate, you mentioned earlier that we are all, that, that you wish to be haunted by ghosts, right? And um, I think we all are, as poets, haunted by something, something of ghosts. And one of the things, of course, it's not a ghost that tends to haunt us, it's cliche. They tend to come back to us, no matter what that is. So sometimes we just have to take them head on. So here is a little sick, twisted advice. When it comes to love, know this. The love of money is the root of all people. Actions speak louder than turds. And two wrongs can fake a right. You know, if it ain't broke, it's probably too little too late. Women who live in glass blouses should never say never, and usually don't. But if the shrew fits, bear it. For no matter how you nice it, it takes two to mangle. For misery loves the company of a bird in the hand. And though some people only hurt the ones they love, others only love the buns they hurt. But above all else, remember to be true to thy selfishness. And that laughter is the best way of throwing stones. And if you love someone, I mean really, really love someone, set them on fire. <laughs> and if they return, run like hell. Because they usually come back heavily on. Letter to my heart, a cliche piece. Is that me? Even though you are so stupidly dull, even though you are the only muscle with a voice and you keep saying the same shit over and over and over, even though you are like my father who has only worked one job his entire life and though he ha thinks he has the right to tell me how to live and even though just like him, your track record in the advice giving department ain't been so great, I love you the way war loves weeping. I love you as glass loathes shatter. I love and loathe how you falter at the never-ending arithmetic of bullets and children. For this haunting hurt you have for Trojan women who were once sold into an ancient slavery, for your disbelief of the unreturned compassion Saladin gave his Christian captives, for Jews forced into conversion and name change, for Palestinian bellies empty of bread. Why do you sigh? for the unmoved dust gathering on unopened books of poems, for every word not said by people who are always, always sad, people songless and silent as pianos with missing teeth. Why are you so easily broken open by mother, mothers who've been broken closed? Don't you know, lonely one? No one wants to hear you at night sobbing yourself bloodless like some soldier that cannot cry himself clean. Dearest, too easily wounded heart, if you continue to crack for each injustice, you are powerless to stop. For every mythic hero you cannot and could never become. For every history of everything you cannot fix or soothe or comfort, what will become of you? You, my stupid, stupid, beautiful you. Earlier, Matt read a piece about the life expectancy of young men who look like me. And this was a piece I was not planning on reading, but sometimes you find that there's a connection with someone in the room, and I was moved by his journey into that hurt and that pain. Many of you may know, and some may not know, that 
African Americans have something we call the talk. It is something that we give to mostly our young boys to help them to understand how to move through a world that has proven itself thus far to be quite hostile to their existence. Advice that's been passed down and passed on. My grandfather passed on certain advices to my father when he was moving from Mississippi to Chicago. My father passed on advice to my brother and myself as we were moving out as young men into the world. And I've had four children, two who are sons, who I've found that I've had to pass this information on to. And my wife, who is not black, has said that I should let people who don't look like me hear this. And my self was like, no, this is in-house. And her family came from Ireland, and she said, I think, based upon our history, that Cher, you should read this. So this is a piece that I did read, and I was contacted by folks in Ireland to also read this piece for them. It was crowdsourced from several black men who've given advice to their children about how to live in this world. It is called From Old Heads to Young Bloods. Advice from black men to those who will be. Hey there, black boy. I just want to talk to you. Let you know I understand the things that you're going through. See, I was a black boy. I grew up in this country, too. Now I got gray hair. Yeah. Yes, I learned a thing or two. Like how to not get eaten, even though you're in the lion's mouth. Like how to not get taken, even though yeah, they might try and take you out. Like how to beat a system bent on beating up your life. How to not get snipered as you dance in the rifle sights. You see those red dots? Yeah. They're looking for your head, kid. See, when you was born, that's the first thing that was messed with, and they'll keep on coming at you to attack and hack into your mental till it's lentil sized brutalized about lies of your potential. I know you hear it, vague and atmospheric, telling you messages like, you ain't gonna be nothing but some kind of thug, son, that poverty and prison's gonna be your only option. I know you can feel how hard it's made for you to get educated so you stay underfed and underrated until you wind up being a fist that's fated to end up incarcerated. See, that's the game. And there ain't enough of me around giving you the skinny on how this business is going down. Admittedly, too many of us old heads treat you like you're our rivals. But lately, I've become more and more concerned about your survival. Because I know that for the grace of older brothers looking out for me, I wouldn't be here to tell any of you young bloods anything. So I ask that you listen to what it is I've come to say. Take the best of what makes sense to you and throw the rest away. First, get the dictionary. Wrestle with those words and learn to use your oppressor's language even better than they can. Why? Because in the language lies all of your oppressor's truths and lies, and learning how they twist them together might better help you to survive. Next, practice four distinct categories of speech. One for the courthouse, one for the streets, one for the classroom, one for your peeps, and no folks are going to judge you by the way that you speak. They'll judge how often you swear, judge the cut of your hair, how you slouch in your chair, judge how often they scare of the color we share, of the truth you declare, of the swagger you dare, the bling and clothes that you wear. So refuse to wear any brand name across your chest unless that brand has done something for this world worthy of respect. Because to present your body branded with somebody else's name is the very essence of what it would have been for your ancestors to have been enslaved. Go get a hand drum. Get to drumming, son. Why? Because the drum is what the oppressor took away from your ancestors to separate them from Africa and make them act more Western and keep them from communicating messages of freedom and escaping. And when you drum and you feel and find that when you close your eyes and your hands strike that skin and you hear the boom bap, boom bap, boom bap, boom bap, boom bap, you get just a little bit of Africa back. But never forget, 
the reality of what it means being a man who was black. It means four heads like yours bobbing inside of one car eventually will e equal one pullover by at least one racist cop. Especially when you've got one hip hop album on blast. Yes, it's racist, at, uh, it's racist arithmetic, but you better learn this math. And when you do get pulled over, and you will, remain still and keep both your hands visible. And when they try to enrage you, threaten to engage you, and they will. Remain chill, cool, calm, sensible, and know that some of your friends who ain't black like you may never understand what it is you're going through. And some others won't give a damn what it is you're going through. So you must be careful which white folks you let know what's killing. See, too many see everything as a zero-sum gain and, gain and gain a sick sense of superiority in their profit and your loss and would rather see you grope without hope than pay the cost of what true equality costs. Some would rather see you hurting than as a full person and if you die in destitution or by clock, 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 being shot by a cop, some will just find a way to justify it, rationalize it, like your grandfather and say, well, they deserved it. And not just some white people, but even some who are white adjacent. You find this same attitude among some immigrants, some Latinx, some Indians, some Asians who've accepted that seeking their American dream means learning to snore through your historic American screams, that acknowledging them might compromise their achieving things, keep them from receiving things they've been told are worthy of having, like a chance at grabbing that American brass ring. So to prove who they're loyal to, some will do almost anything, like lend their voices to the racist chorus and sing, like look at your head, pick up the stone, weigh its weight, and then fling, increase your historic pain and unearned suffering, ignoring how much of your physical and mental maiming and murder this brings. This is the truth, kid. Yeah. In spite of it, as you move through this world, you absolutely must try to give everyone you meet complete respect. But be careful of Respect is something you give anyone just for being. Trust you reserve until there is a good reason. And if there isn't one, leave them alone, son. Don't be afraid to remain on your own, son. And no matter how much pressure this world puts on, son, there is something to that cliche about how pressure creates diamonds. And though you've got your flaws, you keep shining. Dig deep for your gifts. Challenge yourself and others, and you'll find them. And whatever you choose to pursue, strive to be excellent. For while this world plows a path that allows the worst of white males to become president, it makes absolutely no place for mediocre black men. And sometimes you are going to flail and feel like crying. Sometimes you're going to fail and want to lay down and begin the dying. And when that happens, and it will. Remember that poem by Langston Hughes about what the mother said to her son, life ain't been no crystal stair. But you gotta keep on climbing. Black boy, you fight back twice as hard. Duck and dodge, keep up your guard, keep a lifted voice, a lifted vision, and a compassionate heart. Take every opportunity to learn, listen, study, and grow not just book smart, but life wise. Black boy, rise and sing in the dead of night. Take those broken wings you've got and learn to take flight. Take those tear sunken eyes of yours and learn to see. Know how much was given for you to be, be free. Know you are the result of your ancestors sacrificing and bleeding, that you will never know their faces. No, you are what they prayed for, the answer to their pleading. Black boy, keep growing, keep learning, keep your mind turning, keep your fire burning, keep believing. You want to beat the game, black boy. Black boy, keep breathing.
Thank you. I'll, um, I'll end with a final epistolary. Um, when I was, was a, a young man, um, I found out something about myself, and that is that I was a blazing heterosexual. I love this slice of the universe known as woman. I just could not convince them to love me back. I had what they call no game. No game at all. My little brother had game, for those who are unaware of it, is the ability to walk up to a, to a woman, a respective other, and be able to put words together that would make her want to walk off with you, right? I did not have either the words at that time, nor did I have the spot to be able to do that. My little brother had that. My father had it. Clearly, game skips a generation. But my little brother had this line. He would go, he, he would go hey, hey, baby, why don't you slow up for a minute? Oh, you don't have a minute? Well, I'll give you one of mine. I got two. I'm like, how are you 11, bro? How the hell you get game like that? Right? And then my mother, she, she was one of those women who was mad cheap, right? You know, she'd go someplace and, you know, you know if it had a $10 tag on it, she talked them down to eight bucks, right? And so one day she came home with this box of books. And it had, it had like $14 on the side of the books. It was from like Amvets or something like that. And I know my mother didn't pay for it, pay that much for it. But it was priceless to me because in that box of books, I began to go through it and began to see what would later on become what I would do. And uh, one of those books was, became my Bible. It was the complete works of William Shakespeare. And of course, me being a horny 13-year-old, you can imagine that if there's one play I am familiar with, which one is it? Romeo and Juliet. So I read it, thought the language was great, but I didn't really get it. Until one night when I was supposed to be asleep, I saw this version come on television. That was by Franco Zeffirelli, made in 1968. And I was like, that's it. Years later, I found out that you can actually write a letter to Juliet and that she will respond. So I've been doing that with my class uh, at Clark University every year. We've been writing our letters to Juliet. And we've been getting some responses back. And this is the first letter I wrote to Juliet. It's entitled, Dear Juliet, I spent a lot of time working on that title. <laughs> Dear Juliet, I have always wanted to write to you. I have started this letter several times, but always stopped. I guess I was insecure as to what a 21st century African-American man would have in common with a 15th century Italian girl. Especially given that at the time you were around, African-Americans hadn't yet been invented. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed at that, because some folks don't know if they should. You absolutely should. I suppose it also would have been difficult to get a letter to you knowing how your kinsmen feel about conversations between you and men of which they do not approve. And I am sure by now your daddy has talked to your peeps in Venice about Rodancio and that whole Othello Desdemona thing. Tragic bit of business, that. Guess I just wanted to ask you some questions, Julie. What was Romeo really like? I mean, really. Yeah, 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 the story is well known. He comes to a party at your crib and all your cousins, like Tibble, start putting the heavy hating on him. But the brother is cool as penguin poop. That is, until he sees you on the dance floor gyrating your hips to pan, flute, and fiddle. Then he steps to you like some medieval playboy, and next thing you know, you dump your fiance, leave your family, and a whole house filled with hella bling just to run off with some dude you don't even know, only to end up licking poison off his lips. Did you say to yourself, how doth one wearing such tights and funny shoes manage so much swagger? <laughs> Have you seen any other films? Yeah, well, you might want to skip that DiCaprio one. I, I mean, it's Hollywood, big budget, cool and all that, but it's a bit overwrought for my taste. But that Zeffirelli one with Olivia Hussey playing you? Shit, that joint is epic. Now. I know that because of some weird time thing, I am at an age where I could be both your daddy and one of your descendants. So I ain't trying to prove you out of nothing. But were you that cute in real life? 
I mean, I know that during your time, you probably weren't big on bathing or sewage or teeth, but I bet you had to have some kind of pre-Renaissance hotness happening. But yo, back to Romeo. Was there something in how he profaned the holy shrine of your hand? How he could not force his eyes to leave yours even when he gave you his lips to sin and then asked for it back? Or how his kiss was authored by some ancient book that, if it is to open, will only open inside of a young girl once. Sorry to talk so much about it, but ever since I was a boy, I have always wanted to be that kind of man. Now, even though I am married to wife number last, and things seem to be working out a bit better for me and her than it did for you and Romeo, I would still like to know, what made you love him like that? What budded and blossomed inside you that made you so alive that you would follow him into death? Well, enough for now, Jules. I'll write again when I can. When I, can. I don't suppose you text or tweet, do you? Holler back at a brother when you get a minute, all right, girl? Sincerely, a man who still finds just a little bit of the girl you were in every woman. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Charles.